मैडम मैडम ज्योतिर में मैडम या सर सर स्कॉट जैन है रेंडर आंसर हेलो प्रोफेसर स्कॉट हाय हेलो हाउ आर यू आंसर फाइन सर हाउ आर यू गुड थैंक्स या या नाइस टू सी यू हियर वी आर वी हैव टेन मिनट्स टू स्टार्ट या ओके होप यू कैन बेयर विथ अस या नो प्रॉब्लम या मैं ऑडिबल यस यू आर या राइट Scott. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so, how is it going? Fine. Fine. How's your day starting? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. It's nine fifteen. Five in five minutes we will start the program. Okay. So we have only two presentations uh, yeah. today. Or or others also no no only two you okay. and our vice chancellor professor jagannath rao two one good good introduction sir good morning sir dr ramesh good morning all good morning madam oh so um am i able to share my screen yeah you should be able to share we want to check should we, should we test that and also i make sure that the um print is large enough i try to make it larger okay, okay. yeah you just check it okay share let's see if it's okay that's why i got to help na Am I sharing my screen? Yes. Yes. Is it large enough? Yeah, yes. large enough. Yes. Okay. Okay, good. All right, I'll stop sharing for for the moment. Mm. Okay. Okay.
Good morning to all the participants who are uh, here in the Zoom link as well as uh, the YouTube live. Um, in the convener of the collo colloquium, Dr. D. Jyotir May, request you all uh, please mute your uh, videos and uh, audios as we are going to commence the program shortly. All the student participants, please note the instructions that were mailed to you while sharing the link. We are going to commence the program. And uh, please follow the instructions scrupulously. And whatever questions you have, you are requested to share in the chat box. And please do not unmute your audios and videos for the convenience of the organizers. It's a request from the side of the conveners. Mm. Okay, five minutes. Sir, within five minutes, we'll start at the Shala Impam. We see. But it's a little under a moment. It's a sir, but in Kausama. Yeah, what's it? This is sir. Morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Hi, Professor Scott. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm very fine. <laughs> thank you. Good. Good thanks. Yeah. Professor Scott, this is our Vice Chancellor, Professor Jagannath Rao. Nice He's a geologist you. and next speaker. Yeah, nice to meet you. Uh, nice meeting you. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Are you ready? Let, let us start. Yes, yeah, sir. We'll start, sir. Yeah. yeah. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, good morning, sir. I'm Professor Suresh uh, Good morning, Varmoyal. Uh, thank you. We are going to commence uh, the colloquium uh, with uh, a welcome note. Distinguished speakers of the day, Professor Scott Slovic, University of Idaho, USA, 
and Professor Mokka Jagannath Rao Garu, Honorable Vice Chancellor, and uh, one more speaker of the day, respected Registrar, Bhattu Ganga Rao Garu, who is going to give valedictory address. Executive Council member, Professor K.S.D. Ramesh, Professor T. Ashu, and Dr. B. Jagan Mohan Reddy, Campus College Principals, Professor Ramesh, Dr. K. Rameshwari, Dr. V. Persis, Dr. Subhara, Teams of our University, Professor Y. Srinivasra, Dr. Kamal Kumari, Dr. Mata Reddy, and Dr. Uday Bhaskar. Faculty members of all our campus colleges, principals and faculty members of our affiliated colleges, and my dear uh, scholars, student participants, I, Dr. D. Jyotirmai, convener of the Columbium, extend you a warm welcome and a very good morning. Today, in this international virtual colloquium on environmental humanities, we are going to deliberate on the need of the environmental humanities. Stiffly being locked down by the east wind that brought us coronavirus, which was planted in the whole world, all academicians, scholars, and thinkers are immersed in studying the reasons behind such pandemics. Following the path, Adhika Vinayaya University has been the platform for many such debates on COVID therapeutics, possibilities of expanding medicinal plants in Ayurveda, need for the change in public policies at times of pandemics, and uh, COVID-19, its lockdown effect on economy and the significance of social work in the context of a new social environment. And pharmaceutical scenario in this COVID-19, the quarantine diary of our engineering colleagues to encourage the creative skills of the students and faculty in this case of a depressive lockdown. Many such webinars and talks are being organized around the globe. The essence of all these, as far as goes, is that teaching one thing that is coming back to other nature. Till now, we have seen the nature as an object that is very loyal, but now, Coronavirus reminded us of the urgent need to nurture nature. So it is the time to rethink, reorient, and dedicate our ways of development for continuing the existence of human beings on this planet before the bell calls for all of us. With this few uh, remarks of welcoming, I request now the convener of uh, this colloquium, Professor K. S. Ramesh, to give the opening remarks. Over to Professor Ramesh. Good morning, everybody. I hope I am audible. Uh, good morning, Professor Scott Slovic. Good morning, Professor uh, Jagannath Ragaru, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, my fellow principals, deans, faculty members of Adhikavananda University, scholars and students, and other participants of uh, in this colloquium. I am very happy that uh, uh, we have organized and invited two great experts from two sides of the world, literally and symbolically also one from humanities and the other from sciences. As the COVID-19 pandemic has forced the world to shut down, it is time to rethink our relationship with nature, as Dr. Jyotirma has just now uh, said. The pandemic has certainly peeled off the cosmetic layer of the hollow capitalist-driven development that caused irreparable damage to both humankind and nature. 
colonization, globalization, extractivism, as Dr. Vandana Shiva says, has led to mindless destruction of the environment. Whether the virus has its origin in a virology institute or an industrialized livestock, wet market, or as recent revelations say from a mine in China, it is for sure that we have meddled with nature beyond the limits and what the world is witnessing today is the result of the slow violence against nature caused by man for the last few centuries. The impact of this pandemic is so complex that no single academic discipline can claim to comprehend and find a way out. The recent forest fires due to rise of temperatures and heavy loads of carbon pollution through that climate change and the environmental crisis is soon going to take pandemic proposition. Unless we wake up and of course shake up our education system and teach the future generations to live in harmony with nature, the future of mankind is in peril. The time has come, especially in India, to dismantle our narrow academic disciplinary boundaries to find a solution to the imminent climate disaster. Ethicism sciences, environmental humanities, science and technology studies are the new areas that Indian academia should explore. Indian civilization's vision of the past is to live in harmony with nature. It is time we need to renew our ancient vision, navigating safely from the ideological impurities. I am happy that today we have two experts from humanities and from sciences talking on the need for an environmental approach to life and education. Our session today, I'm sure, will be very holistic and scintillating as science is also in. I welcome Professor Scott Slovic and Professor M. Jagannath Rogaru, our Vice Chancellor, speakers for this wonderful session. Thank you very much. Let, Let me, me also, also take, take this opportunity to introduce Professor Scott Slovic to the audience. Visi said, my dear fellow participants, faculty members of Adi Kavanagh University, this is the second time Professor Scott is addressing our university students and scholars. Thank you very much, Professor Scott. Last year, on our request, he gave a Skype lecture during our international conference on writing the Anthropocene, sponsored by the ICSSR. I am really honored to introduce this good friend of the academia in India. Scott Slovic is a University Distinguished Professor of Environmental Humanities at the University of Idaho, USA. The founding president of the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment, ASLE, it's a very popular journal, from 1992 to 1995. He edited the journal, sorry, he edited the journal ASLE, Interdisciplinary Studies in Literature and Environment, for 25 years before finishing his term last month. He has published numerous books and articles to count more than 300 in the field of ecocriticism, including the Routledge Handbook of Ecocriticism and Environmental Com Communication, which was published in 2019 and co-edited with my friend, uh, professor in IIT, uh, Dr. Swarnalata Rangarajan and Vidya Sarveswaran. He currently co-edits the book series Routledge Studies in World Literatures and the Environment and Routledge Environmental Humanities. He has been a Fulbright Scholar and visited numerous universities in Asia and Europe. Due to limited time, I'm concluding the introduction of this distinguished scholar. However, I invite all the participants to visit the University of Idaho faculty website for his detailed scholarly achievements. Thank you very much. And I request now Professor Scott to uh, begin his talk. Thank you very much. Am, am I audible now as well? Yeah, Anyone? very much audible, Scott. Very good, very good. And um, so it is uh, nine o'clock in the evening here, uh, just after nine. Uh, we're 12 and a half hours uh, difference in time from where you are. Um, I'm yeah. delighted to be able to join you for this virtual 
meeting on the the environmental humanities and and also the environmental sciences and and what both of these disciplines can teach us about the time that we're living in. Um, I would like to actually share my screen and uh, allow you to, if you're watching this as well as listening, to follow along with what I'm going to present. Normally I don't read a script when I lecture, but I find for these virtual presentations, it's a little bit easier for me to <clears throat> uh, monitor my time uh, and, and not speak uh, for too long if I'm reading uh, a script. I hope it's not too boring. So I'm going to try to share my screen now. Um, okay, um, can somebody signal to me if, if this is uh, visible? Can you see my script here? Good, very good. Okay, well, I have about 45 minutes to speak and then we'll have some time for a, a conversation or questions and answers. Um, first, I wanted to, so the title of my presentation is Eco-criticism in the time of COVID-19, why and how to practice the environmental humanities during a pandemic. Um, and uh, first I wanted to say some more general things <clears throat> about the field of English literary studies and the subfield of eco-criticism. And then I'll discuss a specific collection of articles on the environmental humanities responses to the pandemic that was just published a few weeks ago on a Swedish website called Bifrost Online. You'll see if you're watching this, um, my, my script, that I have highlighted in yellow some uh, terms or publications that might be useful to you. So the website that I'll be commenting on is called Bifrost Online, and it's uh, coordinated by the Nordic Network for Interdisciplinary Environmental Studies. And they produced this entire collection of uh, numerous small articles representing environmental humanities perspectives to the pandemic. Um, and part of that cluster of articles on Bifrost was an open letter on the environmental humanities and our collective responses to the pandemic also just published in the past month with specific recommend, recommended actions for scholars and others to take as a way of learning something that will help us <clears throat> change our lives for the better during this strange and difficult time. Um, so uh, again, I'll, I'll start with some more general comments about the history of English studies and the evolution of eco-criticism, and then I'll move into my discussion of this recent collection of small articles on uh, environmental humanities and the pandemic um, and and then this open letter that was written or, or signed collectively by many scholars um, about how we might change the way we live and the way we work in light of the situation we're in right now so a year ago before the world changed dramatically, I was asked to gather my thoughts about current trends in English studies for another university in India. They asked me to do this and to give a talk. So I cobbled together some notes about trends in the field of English literary studies, both generally and more specifically in the area of literature and environment. It's rather striking now to turn back and look at what I said in July 2019 in light of what we're all thinking about today because of the pandemic, <clears throat> yes, but also in light of the growing global economic crisis, the Black Lives and the Black Lives Matter movement and the outcry against police violence and racism, which may have been triggered by recent killings in the United States, but has certainly become an international movement at this point. The world has changed uh, in the past year. And the question is not only whether we can be resilient and persevere with business and life as usual during and after the pandemic and other crises ease, but whether we can change ourselves and our societies to be different and perhaps better than we were before. In a little while, when I talk about new interventions in the environmental humanities, I'll be focusing um, uh, on this question, how we might change, and can we, meaning, we change meaningfully in response to what is happening in the world right now. But first, I'd like to back up many years. 
uh, to talk a little bit about my own training as a scholar of English and American literature back in the 1970s and 80s. I learned how to read texts, poetry, novels, essays, plays as cleverly um, as possible and also to write about these works as clearly and eloquently as possible. The idea was to produce articles and books for scholarly audiences. I was encouraged, like many other uh, fellow scholars, to, to follow the example of my professors and communicate with a relatively small community of academic specialists. However, in some ways, the field of English studies has changed tremendously during the past 40 years. I never could have predicted some of these changes and I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about them. Even when I was learning to be a close reader of literature before I went to the university, I began thinking about how what I was studying might be related to the world beyond the text, the world of society, the world of nature. I found myself looking up from the books I was reading and saying, oh yeah, there is a world out there. Even when I was still a student, I felt a need to make my work in literary and language studies somehow relevant to the current problems of the world. I know many of my fellow students were doing the same thing. Some of my classmates were devoting their efforts uh, to developing applications of English studies to understanding multiculturalism, gender, and sexuality issues in society, using literature as a way of steering society <clears throat> toward more cultural awareness and justice. I've always been very interested in such issues, <clears throat> uh, but I've also been keenly engaged in environmental issues since childhood. I gave my first environmental lecture at the age of 10 on the occasion of the first Earth Day in 1970 when I spoke to my primary school classmates about reproductive responsibility and the issue of human overpopulation, which I had read about in Paul Ehrlich's 1968 uh, book called The Population Bomb, a work that I found lying around at my, my house because my parents were reading it. So I guess it made sense for me to turn my literary thinking toward the natural world at a very early stage in my career uh, while still a doctoral student in the early 1980s. As you may know, I was one of the people in the 1980s and early 1990s who helped to create the field now called eco-criticism or ecological literary studies. Where did eco-criticism come from? You could say that there have always been people who've been interested in how we can use literature and other cultural texts to understand the human relationship with the more than human world. I like to say that as soon as there were commentators describing ancient paintings on cave walls depicting animals and plants, there were the beginnings of eco-criticism. This could have started thousands of years ago, but the modern field of eco-criticism really gained momentum in the 1980s when young students like me started analyzing texts from an environmental perspective and developing um, the uh, methodologies and vocabularies for doing this work, just making up the field as we went along. Regarding eco-criticism though, I wanted to say that these days, nearly two decades into the 21st uh, century, or actually two, de full, two full decades into the new century, we are talking less and less about purely literary or linguistic approaches to environmental work, and more about cross-disciplinary approaches in the so-called environmental humanities. I taught a graduate workshop on the environmental humanities at my home university, the University of Idaho, this past semester. And in the middle of the semester, all our teaching went online. So I finished the last two months of the class teaching twice a week via Zoom. The environmental humanities is a meta-discipline a combination of ecology, history, philosophy, religious studies, cultural theory, geography, psychology, and a smattering of other fields, including English studies and comparative literature. Also film studies and visual studies, also anthropology. Quite some time ago, scholars began to realize that if we want our work in the humanities and other fields to enable us to engage with the world's complex problems, ranging from poverty 
and disease to food security and lately <clears throat> such crises as climate change and mass extinction, we cannot cordon off our thinking in narrow academic disciplines. We need to work together with colleagues who've been trained in other fields and we need to constantly expand our own expertise, learning new vocabularies and new ways of understanding problems, new methodologies. So while people like me were trained in English studies, we no longer practice what we were trained to do exactly. We have to continue growing and changing as thinkers. I believe this is what many of the students I work with these days want to do, continue growing and changing as thinkers in order to respond to the world's needs, to society's needs. So what I've been writing about in the past year is the fact that scholars in the environmental humanities, though not previously uh, really included in high level discussions about the environmental future of the planet, have increasingly been invited to have a seat at the table, so to speak. In the past, it was assumed that only thinkers from such fields as ecology, economics, law, and politics had anything serious to say about the environment. But now we realize that psychology and cultural studies have ways of understanding why and how human beings think and behave as they do, and that the environmental crises we face in the world are actually human problems, not merely geophysical problems. Humanists and social scientists are now considered to be essential participants in high-level meetings on environmental issues in government and in academia. During the past year, I've been thinking about how the field of eco-criticism, the language-oriented branch of the environmental humanities in which I primarily work, is now engaged in a fifth wave, a relatively new phase that focuses, and I've highlighted that term fifth wave because it, it, I think it's important to realize that even since 1980, when eco modern eco-criticism really started, there have been, uh, four distinct phases or waves. And we're now in this relatively new phase that focuses on how the human mind produces and receives information, how we communicate such information, and on the training of members of the broader public, not only academics and scientists, but government and corporate officials and lay people to engage in serious discussions um, in the discussions of serious problems like climate change. Part of this fifth wave of eco-criticism involves scholars like me no longer writing only for specialized academic publications, but instead devoting some of our energy to writing for mass media, newspapers, websites, social media. I often find myself going to public meetings to speak about how we perceive biospheric changes, or how we fail to perceive and think about such changes. And I conduct workshops for citizens in various parts of the world, training them to observe the natural world and to communicate their ideas to other members of their communities. This is part of a new movement um, that uh, many of us refer to as academics going public. I've highlighted this in yellow as well, academics going public. And this is the title of a 2016 book edited by Mary Beth Gassman from the University of Pennsylvania's Annenberg School of Communication. In April of this year, a few months ago, I taught a webinar for a group of European graduate students hosted by the European Association for the Study of Literature, Culture and Environment, um, known as EASLC. Uh, and I was training these students to write op-eds for websites connecting their technical research with current issues, and then communicating this research in, in a language, not in their normal scholarly language, but in a, a language appro appropriate for different audiences, the general public, or maybe um, leaders in their particular communities. The Bifrost articles on environmental humanities and the pandemic, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, could also be considered an example it, um, of scholars in this field responding to the current state of the world by writing non-technical essays on short notice. We were only given a few weeks to do this uh, for a general audience. 
Another very new aspect of environmental literary studies that I'm involved with is something that we're calling empirical eco-criticism, which I've also highlighted here. Um, this ties in with what I said above about learning new methodologies to help us understand real world problems and to deepen our understanding um, of literature. There should be an of in there. Uh, empirical eco-criticism involves using techniques from the social sciences, uh, like designing experiments to test how readers process information, stories, and images from literary works, rather than simply guessing about the effects of texts on audiences. And I'm currently involved in developing studies related to such famous writings as Aldo Leopold's essay, Thinking Like a Mountain, um, and our aim in this study is to specifically look at impacts of singular stories or individualized narratives on readers in contrast to more abstract or large scale statements of ecological information. And I hope to demonstrate the power of the psychological concept known as the singularity effect, which means the special potency of small scale individualized stories in guiding people to care about phenomena Last month, I finished, um, as you heard in the introduction, I finished my term as editor-in-chief of the journal Isle, um, which I've been doing for the past 25 years. And in my final issue of the journal, we published a special cluster of articles devoted to explaining and demonstrating empirical eco-criticism. The title, or the introduction to that cluster was titled, Empirical Ecocriticism, Environmental Texts and Empirical Methods. And this um, introduction to the field is available for free at the uh, website of the journal Isle, if you're interested. Other ongoing trends in English studies include the study of uh, narratological theory, basically story theory, as a way of reading literature, except that narratology um, used mainly used to be mainly a philosophical theory but now it's becoming more and more empirical a branch of cognitive science essentially psychological theories have been developed empirically um, such as narrative empathy that is how stories make us care about characters in literature and sometimes help us to feel empathy for actual people and other phenomena and these theories are now being applied to the study of literary narratives um, so one of my colleagues at the University of Idaho is a well-known eco-narratologist. Her name is Erin James, and she published the book, The Story World Accord, Eco-Narratology and Postcolonial Narratives, a few years ago. A related trend to eco-narratology is the study of emotion and affect feeling in the context of literature. And another close colleague of mine at Idaho, Jen Ladino, published a book last year called Memorials Matter, Emotion, Environment, and Public Memory at American Historical Sites. This doesn't really sound like a book by a literary critic, um, but it's a study of how national monuments affect visitors emotionally and how the texts written about such monuments demonstrate or operate on an affective or emotional level. This, these are examples of how literary critics have increasingly expanded their focus beyond traditional um, literary analysis. Now I'm going to share with you a few small parts of my article called COVID World, COVID Mind, uh, which is published in the Bifrost cluster that, I've, that I will talk about in a few minutes. So, um, I'm just going to give you some excerpts from this essay because I'm keeping track of time. Although the current pandemic, and this is from my article, although the current pandemic is a relatively acute moment of crisis rather than a sprawling, diffuse accumulation of social and ecological concerns, this phenomenon is akin to the new world that authors Paul Ehrlich and Robert Ornstein recognized in the late 1980s when they published their book, New World, New Mind, Toward a Conscious Evolution. These two writers, one a population biologist, the other a psychologist, felt that the modern world had come to pose existential challenges to the human species, from the proliferation of handguns among ordinary citizens in countries like the United States to the nuclear arms race. 
They also recognized the AIDS crisis of the 1980s, a possible precursor to today's zoonotic pandemic as a grave threat to human survival. They understood that human beings could not evolve biologically in the short term in order to respond to th threats we had created through our own cultural and technological advances. For these scholars, these writers, Ehrlich and Ornstein, the human species needed to, involve, to evolve intentionally through our own consciousness in order to have a reasonable possibility of persisting in the face of the very challenges we had created for ourselves. This conscious evolution is what they called new mind. As we experience this new COVID world, this COVID reality that is likely actually to be an ongoing reality, not a short-lived disturbance, I think we should be trying to figure out what we can learn from this experience in order to develop new ways of thinking. Together, these constitute COVID mind. For the past 30 years, scholars, writers, and artists, many of them working in disciplines associated with the environmental humanities, have taken in encouragement from Ehrlich and Ornstein's notion of a potential conscious evolution. But despite dramatic advances in the environmental humanities, little progress has actually occurred in the realms of industry, economics, and politics. Steady planetary degradation has unfolded as we plunge ever more deeply into the sixth mega extinction, spewing toxins into the biosphere and CO2 into the atmosphere. The arrival of a novel coronavirus in Wuhan, China in November 19, uh, 2019, or perhaps even earlier, uh, people now think, has led to the global pandemic, which is not only a tremendous public health and economic crisis, but a unique opportunity for conscious evolution, a moment to reflect and reboot and potentially embrace certain cognitive skills that may help us to be a more resilient species moving forward. So these cognitive traits, these new ways of thinking might include the following, and these are just examples. It's not an exhaustive list. Uh, one, a sense of universal vulnerability. Those of us who didn't feel particularly vulnerable in the past, who felt relatively secure and comfortable in our lives, all of us now feel a heightened sense of vulnerability. And this may actually be a good thing. It may lead us to be more careful and think more um, uh, sensitively in our lives. Number two, a heightened awareness of the human mind's insensitivity to exponential and potentially catastrophic change. That again, and it, to be aware that we are insensitive to exponential changes of various kinds, including the development of the COVID pandemic and various other phenomena, uh, such as extinction phenomena and uh, global climate change. Number three, a growing awareness of our, that our interactions with the animal world have genuine consequences for human beings zoonotic transmission of diseases are, are, I think, a prime example that as we expand into a habitat used by other species or have other types of interactions with these animals, um, that, that it not only has an impact on those other species, but on our own species. And then number four, <clears throat> an appreciation of what it means to put on the socio-cultural breaks and change the way we live. Um, all of us who've experienced lockdowns and changes or disruptions in our lifestyles are, have essentially put on the brakes and very suddenly stopped our normal ways of living. And this may in fact be what we have to do in order to uh, rehabilitate our relationship with the planet. We are experiencing that not because we invited it, but because we've been forced from the, by the pandemic to um, uh, appreciate what it means to put on the brakes in this way. At a time when um, corporate and political forces are pressing desperately for a return to normal, I believe we should use whatever social support systems we have available to us as a way of stabilizing those in our societies who are most economically and medically at risk. But at the same time, I think we should recognize that there will never be a truly post-coronavirus world. We will never go back to the same normal as before. 
even an eventual vaccine and a widely available and effective treatment protocol <clears throat> will not free us from other zoonotic threats. For the sake of our species and for the sake of the many other species with whom we share the planet, I think we should use this moment as an uninvited but nonetheless necessary opportunity to practice new ways of thinking, to consciously evolve. The COVID world is also the climate change world, <clears throat> the world of mass extinction and devastating toxicity. We must learn to live with and within this reality. We must mind COVID, not merely overcome it. My own experience of the current crisis <clears throat> is paradoxically one of normalcy and peril. Uh, when people ask me, you know, how are you doing? What, what's your life like these days? Uh, it just occurred to me to start saying everything is strangely normal. And yet I also feel this increased sense of peril. Um, of course, there's nothing normal about the constant barrage of information about the public health crisis, the suffering of so many people who've contracted COVID-19 disease, the strain and despair experienced by those serving these patients as medical personnel, or the desperation of those who are suffering uh, from intensified economic distress and hunger. And yet, for those of us who've experienced our, um, our home confinement, our self-isolation in relatively good health and who've managed to continue our working lives remotely, there's a strange kind of normalcy to our lives, even in the midst of the COVID crisis. Yet I still find myself thinking about the peril of our species in a more acute and visceral way than is normally the case, even though I know the world is, is always fraught with peril, with risk and danger, with uncertainty. What we need to carry away uh, from the current moment is the powerful idea that so-called normalcy and so-called peril coexist in uneasy tension. Today's paradoxical mindset of, of both normalcy and peril should be part of the COVID mind, a way of thinking that helps us to be sensitive to the serious threats we and others face in the world, even if we do not feel ourselves to be in immediate danger of suffering death or loss in a given moment. While there are many people throughout the world for whom peril is an enduring condition of life, what's different about the COVID world is the general sense of peril that now crosses the usual boundaries of race, class, gender, and culture. To me, normalcy enables us to conduct our daily lives with a certain effectiveness, but peril should keep us on our toes, vigilant and concerned. We are all vulnerable, albeit unequally. Pramod K. Nayar um, from the University of Hyderabad in a book, a recent book called Eco Precarity, points to Judith Butler's argument that our lives depend upon precarious environments, people, and processes. Ironically, the vulnerability of human lives threatened during the COVID-19 pandemic has also reminded us of the precarity experienced by other species including the endangered pangolin thought by some, and th there's a link here in the Bifrost article to an article by Tom Van Doren from, from uh, Australia, arguing that the uh, pangolin may, may be one of the possible sources of the um, emergence of COVID-19. So um, the, the precarious endangered pangolin, a small animal like an armadillo, um, is associated with our own precarity as a species, which we're becoming aware of because of the pandemic. I'm keeping a, an eye on the time, and I, I see that um, I'm sort of running out of time. So I'm going to jump ahead because I want to share with you some examples from the Bifrost cluster. And I'll, um, I'll quickly go through some of these examples, and then I will. Um, I will um, conclude with that open letter, a uh, public letter about the environmental humanities and, and the pandemic. So again, Bifrost Online, this is the name of the website. And if you just look at that website, then you can look at all these articles for yourselves if you're interested. Um, I'm gonna skip through that introduction. Uh, to my knowledge, this group of writings 
um, at bifrostonline.org is the main example of how environmental humanities scholars have begun thinking about the current pandemic. As I said, the cluster was published earlier this month, um, or actually just about a month ago, so it's very fresh. I thought I would briefly explain the approaches taken by the contributors to this cluster to give you a sense of how these scholars, uh, most of whom come from the field of eco-criticism, are thinking about the traction that can be gained in our understanding of our current circumstances by applying concepts from the environmental humanities. <clears throat> in their introduction to the cluster, the four editors, um, they highlight potential the potential for dramatic social change that may result from our response to the pandemic. They acknowledge that it's much too early to say whether such transformation will occur, but they claim that the current crisis is helping to clarify the global economic system um, that is based on what a scholar named Jethro Pettit calls, quote, unjust economic relations at all levels and in unsustainable patterns of consumption by the North and by Southern elites, end quote. The editors state that genuinely transformative system change will require much more than for the forced austerity <clears throat> and GDP deceleration of a short-term social experiment that we have neither planned nor completed. Our ability to combine unexpected lessons from early 2020 with other knowledge and neglected wisdom may be central to societal transformation, um, but only if we can apply our understanding with the vision um, and the will and will to level or erase systemic obstacles that reinforce one another socially, culturally, politically, and economically, end quote. In other words, the thrust of this new publication, this cluster of articles, is to try to imagine some kinds of dramatic new ways of thinking about our human selves and societies working in an integrated holistic way to combine disciplines and cultural perspectives. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. So um, one of the first articles in the cluster is uh, by Greta Gard, prominent ecofeminist scholar. Her piece is called The Coronavirus as Messenger, and it asks the question, quote, what if the coronavirus is a messenger awaking humans to our material interbeing? So she uses this phrase, strange phrase, interbeing, the, our interconnectedness and coexistence with other living beings. Um, so uh, Greta Gard was the original author of the public letter to environmental humanities colleagues and the broader community about how we might change our lives in response to the pandemic. And she writes in her article about coronavirus as messenger, quote, perhaps the pandemic letter uh, can function as a mindfulness practice, helping us notice the ways that stepping back from overconsumptive anti-ecological behaviors are often conflated with self-denial, as we who are is entangled with the behaviors of consumption and transport that contributed to the pandemic. If we give up those behaviors, who will we be? She then turns to discuss what she calls sustainable happiness, what does it mean for us to live happy lives that are also sustainable, um, not unsustainable, uh, unsustainably happy lives? She uh, relies on Buddhist theories of mindfulness, queer eco theory, and the concept of interbeing, or a new idea of selfless, interactive coexistence with other inhabitants of Earth, of the Earth. So, Queer eco theory critiques heteronormativity, um, the idea that that uh, heterosexuality is the the only proper or normal um, way of thinking and behaving, and she and eco, queer eco theory, uh, in its critique, um, challenges heteronormativity for being anti ecological in its hierarchical, dominating and non egalitarian. Um, uh, tendencies. Queer ecology, she points out, explores more fluidly connected relationships with the planet, um, more fluidly connected relationships with the planet, with what some scholars have called ecosexual polyamorousness. Um, 
and her uh, essay um, has much to do with the field, scholarly field of posthumanism in its strong critique of the notion of human exceptionalism and isolation from other beings. Um, in sum, she suggests that we might use the pandemic experience as an opportunity to receive messages from COVID-19 to profoundly rethink who we are and how we live in relation to the planet. Uh, coexistence with the non-human is also a key lesson from the pandemic expressed in, in Italian scholar Serenella Iovino's essay, Women Who Swim with the Whales, uh, COVID-19, Ecological Disaster, and Dialogues Across Species and Generations. Some of the other contributions to the Bifrost uh, cluster of essays by people like Kate Rigby from Australia and the UK, and uh, David N. Pello and Jody Adamson and Stephen Hartman focus particularly on questions of environmental justice and the plight of marginalized human communities that have uh, come to light and, and been accentuated um, as a result of what we're learning um, from the pandemic. And I don't really have time to read all of this, except I wanted to point out this concept from Joni Adamson and Stephen Hartman of syndemic, which means that um, uh, complex pathological conditions like the disease pandemic, COVID-19, often share common underlying societal drivers with uh, poverty and um, hunger and various other social crises. So it's a, the pandemic is not isolated by itself, but it's a syndemic in that it coexists with um, various other uh, grave uh, concerns for society. Um, let's see. In other words, the simultaneous social, medical, ecological and ec economic crises we're experiencing across the planet at this time are interwoven in complex ways. The various articles in this new cluster of articles helps us to perceive and understand these subtle intersections. And now I'm almost finished with the talk, but I wanted to briefly talk about the public letter drafted by Greta Gard, whom I mentioned earlier, and co-signed by 40 other environmental humanities colleagues, including me. The, the letter calls for the environmental humanities scholars to throw in or to put, uh, put together our environmental scholarship and practice um, to sustain this reprieve from climate change enabled by the fact that far fewer people are driving and flying than in pre-pandemic times and step back from the professional structures enforcing inequalities of class, race, gender, species, and nation, starting with ourselves. Let's commit, the letter continues, to limit flying, to limit our driving, to schedule our professional meetings and conferences as much as possible on the internet, like this colloquium that we're participating in right now, to eat ethically, ecologically, and locally sourced foods. So to me, the most poignant paragraphs in the open letter read like this, and here they are highlighted in yellow. Uh, these are challenges to our fellow colleagues and to ourselves. Limit your flying to conferences. If your articles, presentations, classes, arts, and activism mean what you say, this is the moment to show it. The enforced constraints of the present COVID-19 pandemic have revealed to us just how much we can accomplish without elective travel for physical meetings. And then review your diet. The lives and deaths of most food animals in industrialized nations are instrumentalized for human carnivory, uh, variously brutal in their confinements and slaughter. The finger points back at us if we fund these diets, there are more, and there are more ecological choices. This letter, which is published among the essays included uh, in the Bifrost cluster and will also appear in various other publication forums as well, is a powerful example of environmental humanities scholars stepping outside of their usual scholarly practices to encourage specific behavioral changes that we and our colleagues have the power to enact in our own lives. 
The letter also uses the moral authority of a large group of scholars in the field <clears throat> from various countries and at various levels in, in the field to urge the international community to consider making adjustments in our collective way of living and doing our work um, a collective way of living and doing our work in order to learn from the pandemic and try to make the world a better, more sustainable place. I hope my comments this morning have been interesting and relevant to the larger focus of this online colloquium. By joining today's event on Zoom, you too are participating in the new wave of light footprint, ecologically and pandemically sensible professional work. Um, thanks for uh, your attention to my remarks. And now I hope we can have some conversation about any ideas that, that this may have prompted for you. Thanks again. Thank you, Scott. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, talk that you have given. And I'm happy you have surveyed um, the way English studies have evolved over a period of time. Yes, in 1990s, when I was doing my post-graduation, we used to think that uh, uh, English departments are more like more or less, more like an ivory towers, elite ivory towers, and uh, how, how very less uh, communication with the outside society. From that, I think uh, today we have evolved where uh, even in India also uh, English teachers and professors are becoming more and more environmental activists. In fact, uh, um, this year, uh, after our vice chancellor is a geologist and he encouraged uh, um, a, a movement that has taken place. Uh, to protect the rivers in the country, led by uh, Sri Rajendra Singh, the waterman of India. And we, uh, there was a, a walk for the uh, um, river Godavari, the, I mean, which is where uh, my city is uh, situated. Um, and so we hosted that. And, uh, and uh, as you said, it's right that uh, uh, geologists, um, I mean, geologists and uh, English teachers, all of them have come together uh, to address this uh, issue. And in fact, in, uh, in your, uh, your, your lecture was heard by all the, from sciences and social scientists, uh, I'm a science professors and social scientists, and even uh, not, uh, not to speak of our own English uh, fraternity. Uh, thank you very much for giving us a wonderful as, uh, our lecture. And, uh, and you have given also the um, way out uh, uh, on how hu uh, humanities can respond to this uh, peculiar or very strange uh, situation that we are all now found ourselves in. Um, I request my uh, colleague, Dr. Jyotramai, to coordinate any uh, question and answers. By perhaps you can take a few um, questions. First of all, uh, thank you, Professor Scott, for an elab uh, elaborate um, uh, readout regarding the need of environmental humanity. Um, we have only a couple of uh, questions. Uh, the first one I am reading out, Professor Scott, am I audible to you? Uh, sure, I can hear you yeah, fine. Yeah. There is one question uh, from Ahmad Ali, one of the faculty members. Is there any possibility of combining existentialism with eco-criticism? Well, I often say that eco-criticism is an extremely porous discipline. I believe you can mix almost anything with eco-criticism. Um, yeah. um, and I would say, you know, as I understand existentialism, um, it, it tends to be um, a somewhat dark and, and at times even nihilistic perspective about the absurdity of experience and the, um, you know, kind of questioning our, our power and, and our significance um, you know, as, as a species or as individuals. Um, but I would say, um, you know, to, to me, and, and you, there may be certainly other interpretations of existentialism, but um, I think there's a kind of profound humility in, in the existential worldview, um, at, in questioning the prominence and, and um, uh, the, the, uh, validity of our individual lives. I think existentialism is, is uh, challenging us to um, not, not feel ourselves to be superior or particularly important in the world, but maybe um, to be more uh, in a more egalitarian and unified way uh, participants in, in the larger, um, how should I put it, um, community of life on the planet. And so 
um, it, to the extent that there's a kind of intrinsic humility in the existential worldview, um, eco-criticism could guide us to look at particular kinds of texts emphasizing an egalitarian, integrated um, sort of interbeing like Greta Gard was getting at in her short essay that I mentioned earlier. And this condition of interbeing um, and the, the, the notion of humans as not being uh, central or superior uh, to other forms of life um, uh, might suggest a somewhat existentialist perspective. Um, so that's what initially occurs to me when I hear that question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I hope uh, Ali might have got the sense of it. As one more question we have. Um, uh, Edwin Moses um, had a question. He is requesting for your comments on the significance of indigenous knowledge in addressing ecological crisis. Well, this is a huge um, suggestion and a very important suggestion um, and indigenous knowledge. I, I, I like the, the broad uh, suggestion that there may be a, a large category of indigenous thinking that is um, intrinsic to many different parts of the world where we have indigenous peoples and indigenous wisdom. Um, so um, many scholars in environmental studies refer to this concept that they call in English, T-E-K, traditional ecological knowledge, or T-E-K. And this notion of, of T-E-K, traditional ecological knowledge, is specifically um, oriented toward um, retrieving or, or gathering the wisdom of indigenous cultures in many different parts of the world. Um, and, you know, from uh, maybe tribal cultures in India to traditional philosophies in Japan to Native American thinking in North America and, and I, throughout the Americas. Um, there, again, as I said, there's no part of the world that does not have um, uh, indigenous peoples and indigenous wisdom that may be valuable to us. At the same time, I think it's important for us not to um, what kind of blindly and uh, reductively um, in an oversimplified way assume that all traditional knowledge is better because it's traditional. There's a, there's a tendency to romanticize traditional wisdom as well. And I think we need to be realistic and honest that, that um, our ancestors and our traditional peoples are human beings, just like modern people, and that there may, while there may be traditional wisdom that is extremely valuable and that we should recover and try to uh, weave in with our modern ways of thinking, I, I think at the same time, we need to be realistic and honest um, and try not to be, um, uh, to overly romanticize or exaggerate the unique wisdoms of traditional peoples. So, but in any case, uh, that's a huge field of study. And I know a number of my scholars in the field of eco-criticism who are especially interested in finding a way to weave together modern uh, social and environmental theories with uh, traditional ways of thinking. So thank you for that comment and, and suggestion. Yeah, uh, I think uh, you can take a couple of questions more, Scott. We have uh, two more from our uh, faculty members. Uh, Dr. Suresh Frederick uh, from Tirichi is asking. Hello, Scott, am I audible? Yes, yes I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Suresh Frederick is asking how empirical eco criticism is different from a normal eco criticism. Great. Well, as I said very briefly, uh, empirical, so in normal eco criticism, often we assume. That, that various kinds of texts, not only literary texts, but any, any kind of human cultural expression that we're studying, could be film, music, painting, food, clothing, architecture, any, any way of we have of expressing our, our uh, cultures and our personal visions of the world. Um, we assume that the, the meaning of that text um, based on our own 
personal interpretation, our own reading. Empirical eco-criticism uses social science methodology to conduct experiments. I, I, I think uh, someone else has unmuted a microphone. Um, we, what we do is we try to conduct experiments using the, the techniques of social science in yeah. order to study larger uh, uh, samples of uh, audience responses to those texts so that we can come up with more reliable information, more reliable data about the impacts and the effects of these texts. So uh, essentially, um, traditional eco-criticism uses a sample of one, the, the, the individual scholar, and empirical eco-criticism in collecting data from larger groups of audiences who respond to experimental um, studies um, gives us, I, uh, the, we assume, a more reliable um, understanding of the impacts and meanings of these texts. So if you go to the IELTS website and you can see three examples of empirical eco-critical studies, as well as a very nice introduction to the uh, overview of the entire field. And the overview is available as an, what's called an editor's choice article, meaning that it's for free. You don't need to be a subscriber to IELTS. If you go to the website, you can just click on that and download a PDF of, of that article to get a sense of that field. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Uh, our management professor, uh, Professor Takey, has a question regarding, you know, how do we balance between ecological sustainability and economic viability? Well, this is a, a big challenge, I think, for, you know, all of us around the world. Um, and uh, I guess one of the issues is, is um, what are the, I mean, in, in some ways, economic sustainability um, is in some ways more concrete and visible we, we, and also available to us in the short term. When we behave in certain ways, we can use natural resources and earn an income and uh, support ourselves physically, materially. And, and that's a particularly vivid type of, of um, uh, success. And ecological uh, value um, is sometimes more invisible and uh, more subtle and also long term. And the, you know, we, we can't always uh, uh, understand that, that by not doing certain things, by leaving the environment alone and not using all of the available land and other resources, we are actually creating a sustainable and habitable planet for ourselves and other species, which is in the long term, uh, perhaps a very good thing for ourselves and our, our children and for many future generations of human beings and other species um, who require um, a, a healthy uh, biosphere uh, for continued existence. So I would say the intangibility and invisibility of ecological health um, in comparison with the short-term tangible material benefits of economic value um, mean that, that often society seems to rely or to, to lean particularly in the direction of economic um, uh, importance rather than ecological importance. And that's, we could argue that that's one reason why we're in the kind of environmental predicament that we're in right now, that, that we as a species have tended to, to um, gravitate toward short-term econ economic benefits and comforts rather than um, patient long-term um, uh, ecological benefits. So uh, th this is a, a major struggle in societies all around the world. It sounds like I might not be audible, but my mic is on, um, so it's not muted. So I'm not sure why I wouldn't be audible. Um, in any case, th this is a huge area of discussion, um, the, the tension or balance between economic and ecological values. So uh, another very important topic to bring up. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, Scott, may... Or permit me to 
supplement you. Uh, I draw the attention of Professor Teki to one of the uh, recent books that have been published, Local Futures, uh, by Helena uh, Norbeg Hodge, where she speaks about how to scale down the economies uh, to the human level. And uh, she brings in the uh, Buddhist theories, as you have mentioned in your lecture also, the Bush Buddhist theories of economics, uh, and uh, uh, how, uh, rather than uh, globalization, the movement should be towards uh, localization. So, but I mean, it's not so simple as I say, just as an opposite, but uh, uh, but localization to uh, at least to a certain extent, we should be able to scale down our economy and live a more sustainable uh, life. Thank you. Yeah, and I would also point to some of the articles by Bill McKibben uh, and, and uh, books by Bill McKibben, uh, the uh, U.S. author, a very prominent writer on a wide range of environmental topics. And Bill McKibben specifically writes about local communities um, and uh, uh, new ways of thinking about economics. So, so you might look for McKibben's work as well. Uh, thank you, Scott, uh, as well as Professor Ramesh. I have one more question from Dr. Ramaneshwari, who is a professor in geology. Uh, as Scott has been a reviewer of the journal for 25 years, what areas have been showcased as major forces of change to be taken for sustainability of the environment? Hello, Professor Scott. Hello, hello. I'm thinking about. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you get the question? Yeah. I'm sorry. Exactly. I'm sorry. I, I actually I need to think about this a little bit. Um, Shall I read it out again? Uh, sure, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. She's asking, as you are a reviewer of the journal, what areas have been showcased as major forces of change to be taken for sustainability of the environment? What are your observations as a reviewer of the journal for? Um, uh, in a quarter uh, century or so. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, well, hmm, the, I mean, the, the issue of sustainability, uh, I mean, it, it's often an, an implicit kind of embedded concern in these articles that, that there's a yearning for ways of making human society more sustainable, um, enabling us to live in, in better harmony or balance with, with the planet. Um, but I, I don't know that a lot of the articles in IELTS, and we've published more than 700 scholarly articles during the years when I've been the editor in chief of, of this journal. Um, and a lot of them have not really focused on issues of sustainability explicitly on the surface, um, but there's a general ethos of uh, sustainability, a yearning to uh, scrutinize and and uh, explore the meaning of human life on the planet and, and often to critique certain tendencies, individual tendencies and societal tendencies that interfere with sustainability. Um, I mean, there, it, it would be very difficult to, just in a brief answer, and I only have a minute or so to do this, to, to outline all of the nuanced um, examples of, um, ways of working towards sustainability in the journal aisle. Um, but there, there are a number of approaches that have been published in aisle that have specifically criticized our tendency to, to be anthropocentric, um, excessively focused on our own well being, our, our short term obvious material well-being and not necessarily understanding the the deeper perhaps more fundamentally important um, uh, health of our relationship with with other species and with the planet and so this critique of anthropocentrism and this the critique of what what uh, some people call our ecophobic uh, tendencies um, our, 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 our dislike or our discontent with the natural world. Um, um, the, the, uh, the scholar Simon Estock from Canada and um, more recently from South Korea has in, uh, put forward this idea of ecophobia. And he claims that many of us um, live in an ecophobic way. We may think of ourselves as lovers of nature, but if you look at our lifestyles, we are actually behaving in ways that that are uh, 
oppressing and uh, disrupting the natural world. And, and so a number of people in the pages of Isle um, have written about ecophobia as this broad tendency that interferes with our efforts to achieve a, a more sustainable society. So I realize we have to get on to the next lecture and uh, I appreciate all of these very good questions and comments and all of you who've been paying attention to my talk and, and to my remarks. And so thank you very much, but I, I don't wanna to take too much of your time because I know that I'm just the first act of this uh, colloquium. So thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I, one last question I have. Uh, because I've been reading some of the books on eco-criticism these days, I observed that, um, you know, it is being portrayed that uh, Christianity is in a way insensible in caring the nature or the environment. Maybe because it uh, preaches that um, do not worship the creation, but the creator. What do you have to share in this regard? Uh, well, I, I think, it's uh, difficult to, to um, make only a single comment about any cultural tradition or any religious tradition. I, I think even within Christianity, there are certain um, denominations or, or sects, uh, subgroups that are um, particularly oriented toward uh, respect for the natural world. Um, and I would point your attention to the Franciscan tradition um, the, uh, the, the tradition of St. Francis of Assisi, which is very much a nature-loving, um, uh, nature-caring um, point of view. And so uh, years ago, I read an article by Baird Callicott, one of the famous scholars of environmental ethics, in, in which he, um, he, he was responding to uh, Lynn White Jr., who wrote a very famous essay um, called the, the biblical, as I recall, the biblical origins of our environmental crisis. And Lynn White Jr. specifically called out or criticized Christianity and, and certain passages from the, the Christian Bible as being exploitative and domineering toward nature. And Baird Callicott in his article said, that particular point of view is not the only Christian point of view. There's also the Franciscan tradition, um, which is much more benign in its, and, and positive in its thinking about nature. So you know, I, I would mention that in particular, but there are many other very important religious traditions and, and I see quite a few scholars writing in powerful ways about the, the lessons we can gather from um, various religions um, and this would include a traditional and even tribal worldviews and theologies um, that help us to think more deeply about our connections to the world. So, uh, you know, the Latin roots of the word religion, religio, um, are all about connection. Ligio is, is Latin for to connect. And so I, when I think of religion, I think of it as a, a way of thought that helps us to understand our connections to existence, to including the planet. And this would include not only the Christian tradition, but many other religious and cultural traditions. Thank you, Scott. It was, uh, it's a good um, um, you know, explanation that you have given. Thank you very much for being a part of this colloquium. And our faculty have actively interacted with you. But for the time, we could have uh, uh, you know, presented some more questions because um, our Vice Chancellor is going to give the next session. We have to close uh, the question answer question, uh, session now. And uh, I thank you very much. And now I invite uh, Professor Ramesh for concluding remarks on this particular session. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jyotunmai. And uh, Scott, really uh, great thanks to you because uh, this is the second time, I think, uh, this time, we, I think we did not uh, keep you awake for a long, for long time because you can go to bed now <laughs> after this. But because last time uh, you gave your lecture in the middle of the night for, uh, for the benefit of our uh, students okay, so, uh, uh, during the conference. So thank you once again. Uh, and uh, we, I hope uh, 
uh, even though um, i mean uh, we are we are meeting online i think we i hope we can find some time uh, to you to come over to india and be and address our students and uh, maybe we can do something uh, big on this uh, thank you very much for being with us thank so, you uh, thank now, you very much uh, yeah thanks bye bye <clears throat> now it is time uh, to listen to the head of our institution um, professor mokka jagannath rao garu honorable vice chancellor before sir takes over to present uh, i just give i uh, want to give a brief introduction of our vice chancellor uh, who is the relentless teacher ardent researcher and enthusiastic environmentalist our vice chancellor professor mokka jagannath rao garu is educated in india and abroad and he got his masters in engineering from university of alaska usa he got his phd from andhra university in visakhapatnam in 1985 later he joined his career as assistant professor in the department of geology andhra university in 1986 and later he was promoted as professor and head of the department from the same department of geology uh, a serious researcher and academician is having more than 30 years 3 uh, years of experience in both teaching and research he has published nearly 150 papers in national and international journals um a teacher's work is revealed through his number of his uh, research scholars sir has 33 scholars who worked and got awarded phds under his guidance and uh, he they are not only from geology but also from computer science geoengineering geophysics and allied physics he has a strong research collaboration with various organizations from usa canada and australia has completed eight funded projects from the leading funding agencies of this country including dst ugc csir dod apmdc dmr tuf mo ministry of earth sciences isro and ongc sir has got consultancy projects from ongc there are huge projects uh, and studies on holocene evolution of mahanadi delta studies on land subsidence due to hydrocarbon exploration and exploitation at kg bg basin ap using rem remote sensing and field studies sir has a vast experience in administration besides the academic uh, uh, record he held various administrative pro, uh, positions like director for information management center andhra university visakhapatnam dean for pg and professional examinations director of international student affairs andhra university director for delta studies institute chairman for board of studies department of geosciences ambedkar university srikakulam and head of the department department of geology andhra university and many many others he has filed a patent entitled an inventive model that explains the genesis of bay of bengal and arabian sea which is under consideration Uh, sir got many awards and honors including dr sarve palli radha krishnan award the best academician award of the year uh, 2019 by andhra university if sir was also awarded the scientist of the year uh, 2017 by national environmental sciences academy new delhi sir uh, uh, is an editorial board member of indian journal of environment and eco planning and he is the member of various professional scientific bodies of national and international repute and sir is also one of the nac assessors and many more and uh, as a member in various boards of selection committees and national and state level uh, boards uh, in the country um, before he entered the career of teaching which of course uh, is his passion his earlier selections include upsc civil services group b service and upsc exam in 1985 and upsc geologist examination and he secured 11th rank in india in 1983 but uh, his passion led him into the teaching and uh, uh, sir is a dedicated and committed teacher uh, this is the feedback that we uh, you know received from many of the students 
of andhra university and of course the scholars also and we feel that sir is also missing that teaching career being the vice chancellor burdened with the uh, administrative responsibilities of adikavi nanaya university but sir it is fortunate that we have here uh, uh, you as the vice chancellor Uh, whom we feel is the right person to lead the university at this time but for you uh, we don't know how this uh, season of pandemic uh, we could have uh, led because uh, you have taken up and you have motivated us motivated us continuously to take up uh, um, online teaching as well as organizing webinars and all the departments were doing that and uh, we don't find any difference uh, even in the days of lockdown and it is all due to your great personality above all this sir is a very amicable uh, and friendly humane personality who encourages each and every one uh, according to his or her capabilities to do anything with whatever we go forward and submit to sir thank you sir for being a support all these days um, in all the activities we are taking up uh, from our university side with this few words of introduction sir now i welcome welcome you to give your session sir oh thank you oh dr jyotir mai uh, i hope i am uh, audible to you yes sir okay so uh, after uh, uh, the lecture by uh, professor uh, scott uh about this uh, echo criticism of uh, covid-19 pandemic uh, now this is the time for me to present uh, some uh, scientific uh, perspective of the environment and uh, how this uh, during this covid-19 what is happening to the environment and uh, what is the observations of a geologist so today i am extremely happy and congratulate uh, the organizers uh, dr jyotir mai professor ramesh and i could see our registrar professor ganga rao principals dr ramaneshwari and dr persis and executive council members uh, dr jagan mohan reddy and professor ashok and we have professor suresh verma professor teki uh, and other uh, colleagues i am extremely happy to be part of this colloquium uh, and also i congratulate uh, our uh, earlier speaker uh, professor scott for his uh, excellent presentation Uh, the first time i could hear uh, the environmental or eco criticism through this uh, professor of uh, english language how the a language professor will be thinking about the environment what are their ideas or how they suggest the remedial measures for uh, to live with the harmony with the environment all these things were really uh, informative and it is a new direction maybe for us being scientists uh, and uh, the thinking of a social scientist a linguist uh, is a, is giving us some new idea in direction for us also i thank for organizing for such a a wonderful speech uh, by an intellectual person like professor scott now i want to share my screen maybe i i think uh, i think you will be able to see this Yes sir. Uh, is it, it okay visible. for you? Yes sir. Oh visible okay. okay. Yes sir it's visible. It's visible. Yeah. So this is the title of my talk COVID-19 the environment observations of uh, a geologist. 
So uh, when I see this, being a geologist, I wanted to give you a small uh, background about the geology. Because we majority of the participants today are not from uh, geology and especially they are from uh, the English department. Maybe they, they maybe are interested to know some facts about our planet Earth on which we are all living. So when you see the planet Earth, when you cut it, you can see you have the crust mantle and the core on which we are on the top of the crust. We are living on the surface, but uh, we are exploiting the resources from the crustal parts. When you talk about the age of the earth, because I want to tell you that the planet Earth is very old, as old as 4,500 million years. So when you see the rocks on the surface of the earth, based on their age, they are given this uh, right from Archean to Proterozoic, to Phanerozoic, where you have Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. And you can see the, their age in millions of years in the right side column. So you can see the Earth has been evolving since 4,500 million years. And uh, in these ages, when you take the very early part of the Earth's history, we call it a Precambrian. During Precambrian, it is just it was forming. It was a burning a fireball. Slowly, it cooled down and it solidified. And initially, after it is uh, cooling, Earth was looking something like this. Then slowly, an early Precambrian, after a later Precambrian. The Earth was full of volcanic activity. So it was still in the process of cooling. So these volcanoes were supplying all these gases into the atmosphere. There were no life forms were available during Precambrian. And after some time, what you call during Proterozoic, the primitive atmosphere and water bodies evolved. When the primitive atmosphere and water bodies evolved, very early forms of primitive life started living on this planet Earth. We call it the life of Paleozoic. Then when you see the planet Earth's geological evolution, each and every geological era was unique and famous for life forms. Suppose you see the Gondwana. It is about 200 to 250 million years ago. The entire earth was having luxuriant growth of forests because at that time, the atmosphere was rich in carbon dioxide. Initial atmosphere rich in carbon dioxide. So it was uh, very favorable for the growth of luxuriant forests. You will be surprised to see that these forests were so thick and the trees were having competition to catch the sunlight. They were growing taller and taller and they were so huge and uh, the entire act was having these Gondwana forests. So this is the Gondwana period which we call is a Carboniferous because we have the carbon because these forests latter gave rise to the coal deposits. So Gondwana period in the geological history gave us the coal deposits because all the coal deposits now we are having as a resource, as an energy resource 
or from Gondwana period. So coal has formed in Gondwana period because of these luxuriant forests. So this is the Carboniferous forest. Yeah, you can visualize the an artist's impression how these uh, uh, trees were there. When you come to the little younger, which we call the Jurassic period. The Jurassic period was famous for the, the reptiles are, uh, you, you know, like a lizard. We see now a lizard is a reptile. But the, the reptiles at that time were so, so huge, even they are larger than the present day elephants. So they ruled the planet during Jurassic. We have seen uh, uh, the film Jurassic Park, where that, uh, the film uh, depicted how these animals were living and roaming on the planet Earth. So this is a, a one more picture of those, uh, both uh, they are uh, carnivorous and herbivorous. So they rule the earth. And slowly, at the end of the Ju Jurassic uh, time, the mammals came under the planet Earth. And uh, then you have, in the tertiary, you have woolly mammoth, the Mavi, the early, early uh, elephants, the ancestors of the elephants, they ruled the uh, planet Earth. And you have also some more fauna of the tertiary. And this is what the primitive man. So we are the youngest species. And you see the modern man is only just uh, 35,000 years. Just I want to make a comparison. The Earth's planet Earth's age is 4,500 million years, whereas we, uh, the youngest species on the planet Earth, I want to, I, I cannot hesitate to say, doing maximum damage to this planet. All the species came and gone, but they never never damage, made any damage to the planet. The human being, the angus of all. So, because of the greed, in the name of development, in the name of comfort, in the name of happiness, so we started exploiting the resources indiscriminately, and we should realize that we are not the owners of all these resources today. We share these resources with other species as well. And also we should realize that present day we are living, it doesn't mean that we own all these resources, we exploit all the resources the way we like. We cannot do that. We need to see that this environment is sustained for the future generations. So man has destroyed the earth and its resources. His greed has been the cause of natural calamities, climate change, global warming, and uh, the great damage to the environment. It is very commonly we say, we are doing damage to the environment. Every other day we say this. But still, we need to realize, we need to adopt policies to stop such unsustainable consumption, ecological destruction, including climate crisis or climate change. Every year, the consumption of our resources is increasing by 15 to 20% on an average. At this pace, environmental havoc can lead to complete collapse of the ecosystem very early. There are many uh, destructions we see. Deforestation is one of them. We are cutting the trees and forests 
for the sake of logging timber producing timber for various uses this is one uh, destruction similarly we are pumping the pollutants into the atmosphere the heavy metals toxic sludge the plastic and it is a uh, it is there it is polluting all the surface water including oceans including rivers lakes ponds etc it seems about 70% of china's lakes and rivers are now polluted from industrial waste leaving 300 million people forced to rely on polluted water supplies so in our country is no different from china and all our lakes rivers surface water bodies are being polluted and unfortunately the pollution is not being done only it, it is a very irony I, the irony is we should realize the pollution is being done only by few people running the industries so for their greediness they are pumping toxins toxic sludge to the atmosphere despite the environmental regulations despite the law we have which need to be protect the environment but still it is being done so we need to think where the fly is similarly we have mining a mining is another uh, thing where we have to use the mineral resources i cannot say being a geologist i won't say but we need to stop mining but mining need to be done in a sustainable way active mining will be using drilling blasting and release fine dust and toxic gases into environment similarly mining when you have to mine an area you have to remove the vegetal cover of that area you will be doing that and so you have a great damage to the environment similarly we have the urbanization we are making the areas concreteized people are moving on to the urban areas and causing many problems including there are a lot of environmental impacts because there is a resource crunch people depend on these resources especially the water and land and because of the cramped cities so it becoming an environmental disaster similarly we are making our air of poor quality the air pollution has been an increase because all these industries are are emitting a lot of toxic gases and particulate matter into the atmosphere so we know what is happening to the cities nowadays where this air quality index of delhi is 625 which should be less than 50 in fact similarly the rise of consumerism and a shift away from values of community and integrity and towards competition and materialism is another area we need to think about the us center of disease control and prevention studies say that 60% of the known infectious diseases in humans are transmitted from animals for years scientists have wondered that filthy farms crammed full of sick animals are breeding grounds for new antibiotic resistant superbugs now we we have realized that the corona virus is also one such 
virus came from these sick animals or animals or by eating these, killing these animals. Environmental exploitation is harming mankind. Since the Industrial Revolution, our energy use has increased 25 times to feed our consumption, fresh water use 10 times, and land under cultivation and habitation has expanded. In the process, we have destroyed 30% of our tropical forests and our wild animals, mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles. We are, in fact, so in a period of greatest species extinction in the last 60 million years. When you see the geological history, there have been extinctions, but those, ex those extinctions are the natural. But now, these extinctions, I should say, they are man-made. Again, I'm telling you, we are the youngest species, but we are the, unfortunately, the cause for the extinction of the species, many other species. Unfortunately, we do not have right to do that. In fact, all other species have right to live on this planet like us. But because of our intelligence, our greediness, our so-called under the name of development, we are destroying the environment. In turn, we are making other species just to disappear from this planet Earth. Another thing is the climate crisis is the most consequential impact of this greed. It is not something that will happen in future. It is happening in front of our eyes. So we are now lacking fresh air to breathe. Similarly, because of this global warming, the polar ice sheets are melting. There may be many consequences, like uh, sea level rise, the submergence of uh, coastal areas, and many other impacts we'll be facing very soon. Similarly, the indiscriminate use of pesticides. They're entering into the waterways, water bodies, and killing all the life forms of these water bodies, including the fish, which we can see in this picture. Inhaling a polluted air affects lungs and the most, as per the WHO, analyzing particulate matter in the air across the globe, that close to 90% of people globally were exposed to severely polluted air and about 7 million died. Another thing is the poverty. The people coming to cities, they're living in slums. The poverty is not like natural as rain or snow. People are made poor, kept poor. Poverty is a man-made disaster that demands an immediate response. Poverty is the mortal sin of modern times. Many dangerous viruses, infectious, are coming through the animals. They are transmitted to humans from other animals. There are no specific drugs for most dangerous human viruses. When I talk about uh, the environmental disasters, now I see COVID is one such indicator. The COVID-like disasters are about to come in future. As Professor Scott in his lecture said, post-COVID will not be normal as earlier. That is, that is very, very interesting, very scary statement. The post-COVID world will not be the normal as earlier. That means we have to realize that post-COVID era, we need to be ready for such more pandemics, such more disasters, more problems for the common man. 
So that kind of uh, situation will be prevailing. So it is a it is an indicator. It is an alarm. So when 1.5 crore people are affected by the corona now, it is close to 11 lakh people being infected as on today. It is rising. The pandemic has caused the major healthcare system across the world to collapse. The economy is collapsed. The systems have collapsed. And the higher education is no exception. The process of fighting the pandemic This is the first time all these uh, health workers are facing such situation. They don't have any clue how to, how to control, how to help the people who are suffering, how to console them, how to make them happy, how to relieve them from this pandemic because they do not have a clue. They never expected such pandemic of such intensity. So this is an alarming situation. As a result, we have observed many issues being caused due to our fight with this environment perspective, we could see some surprising results. The COVID-19 gave, has, give, has given us some lessons because the system has been shut down. It is like an experiment. If the COVID is not there, it would not have been happened because we have been confined to the, our homes. We are not using our vehicles as earlier. All the industries are shut down and all the activities came to a standstill. So it is a blessing in disguise to understand what will happen if we reduce the usage of technology? If you reduce the usage of resources, if you reduce the usage of the nature and exploitation of nature and environment. So this gave us an opportunity. I call this as a real time experiment to see what will happen if we reduce the resource use, then let us see. And we will go to that little later. COVID cases are increasing and the health system is buckling under pressure. More people will find themselves stranded, denied access to the basic health care. The total cases here are about uh, more than 1 million or 11 lakhs in India. And uh, this is now increasing. When you close down, what has happened, we'll see. The traffic congestion has almost disappeared. And it seems people to stay at home in order to stop the spread of COVID 30% in Delhi and 15% in Ahmedabad, reduction in pollution has been observed. According to the real-time water study of CPCB, the Ganges became more pure and uh, pollution has reduced. Similarly, global CO2 emissions in recent times reduce significantly in this four months period. When people are not there, people are not occupied, the land, there are, the wildlife are coming freely and we could see even these birds are roaming on these roads freely. So what we are learning from this, the COVID-19 is a pandemic. If this pandemic gives an opportunity to study how the environment can come back to normalcy, can recoup itself, then the man can reduce 
the resource usage, reduce the stress on environment, reduce the stress on the resources. The biggest problems facing the world today are not all beyond our control. Rather, they're all of our own making and entirely in our power to deal. Man is consuming more than what is required. So now, when you reduce it, this experiment is telling what will happen. The COVID-19 lockdown, nature gets an opportunity to heal itself. The air pollution is decreased. The flora and fauna are flourishing. The improvement in air quality and which are the some benefits we could see within very, very, very less time. Few months, two, three months time. So now it is proving the environment we can protect still. We are not in very big danger. If you take precautions, if you take reduce, if you reduce and renew and recycle and use resources judiciously, then we can we can restore the environment. We can live in harmony with the environment. The COVID-19 lockdown has claimed many lives globally, but has also made us to watch how it can heal from behind our windows. While the lockdown does lower the toxicity levels in the environment, the the question is, can we sustain these practices after the quarantine ends? The, the COVID pandemic is giving lessons to us. We need to really sit and think. Can we avoid such pandemics? Can we protect the environment? Can we reduce resources use? Can we protect the environment for future generations? That's what we need to think. Now we want to have some concepts of anthropocentric view. Being a scientist, these concepts are uh, very interesting for us, very new for me. I have, I have done some, some study in a couple of days and have taken these concepts from the literature. The anthropocentric means we think the human being has ever right. The everything in the universe is arranged to produce and serve humans. So how selfish we are. Maybe we are very, very intelligent, but still we have no right to deny the right of other species of this planet Earth. So when you talk about ego versus eco, so we should leave our ego. We, we are human beings after all. Maybe we are intelligent beings, but still we need to give same right to other species to live on this planet Earth. Ecocentric is a concept which we need to propagate. Preserve the ecological integrity, complexity of the systems. Life will thrive. Some broaden this way to say we are one species of many, not more important than the others. We are sentient and can alter our environment. We must restore degraded ecosystems, remove pollution, and deal, deal with the global environmental problems. So as a human being, when I talk about ecocentric, we are so intelligent. We are knowledgeable and we know that we are the reason for the damage that is done to this environment. So use the same knowledge, same intelligence to restore the environment because we need to be answerable to the other species of the planet Earth. So as a scientist, I want to say this. When we could destroy the environment with the intelligence and the scientific knowledge, we can restore also. As, a, as just now I said, the pandemic gave us an experiment. It gave the result of experiment that it can be restored. The nature can heal itself. So that is what is ecocentric. When you see the environmental value systems, one side you have ecocentric, 
you have anthropocentric and technocentric. We have technology centered, people centered, nature centered. We need to make a balance among all these three. So let us use the technology, the technocentric perspective to stop, to restore the nature and we'll go towards ecocentric, nature centered, minimum disturbances to nature. Technology solves the problem. People are managers of the earth, but people are not owners of the earth. Only we are the custodians. Being the intelligent beings, we have a right and responsibility to not only to exploit, but also to sustain, to serve other species. So these are again the explanation of these technocentric and anthro anthropocentric views. There are the ethical decisions, ethical questions. So we need to develop, we need to use the resources. We cannot stop the development. We cannot ask people to stop using resources. But we need to have a, have a balance between these two. What you call is a sustainable development. The deep ecology, human nature harmony, according to the analytic principles of both anthropocentric and ecocentrism, is to the ability to make environmental decisions to satisfy both positions. Maybe it is difficult. Quite candidly, nature and humanity are devastated when we practice the exploitation. The conversion to ecocentrism overnight is impossible, especially in the developed societies because of their heavy reliance on resources and generation of waste. So it is very difficult, but this is a time to think because the COVID-19, a pandemic has, a, has a given us this lesson. Now it is, it is the right time to think, right time to sit, where to stop, where to draw a line between the development and the environmental protection. In the anthropocentric practice is widespread and is considered to be responsible for severe environmental crisis, we know. So these are the effects of deforestation, logging, greenhouse gases, global warming, etc. But we need to think, stop anthropocentric thinking and go ecocentric version, use the technology. So technological, technological centric and come back and protect our environment. There are opposing environmental perceptions. Ecocentrism and anthropocentrism are recognized as one of the common ecological moral dilemmas, very naturally. People who hold anthropocentric view acknowledge that we are the most powerful beings and our happiness is ultimate. The universe and all the resources belong to us. Whereas ecocentrism recognizes intrinsic value that all living beings on the earth have equal right to live and to survive. It also encourages people to respect and care for animals and plants for their own sake. So being intelligent animals, intelligent beings, we should be thinking about the rights of other species of this planet as well. Let us practice this ecocentrism in future and see that there is a balance between the development and the protection of the environment, so which we call the sustainable development and which we call environment friendly technologies so that the environment is protected and the development is ensured and continued. The solution the clean technology is a necessary condition for sustainable development. Human mentality transformation towards ecocentric solutions for sustainability. Modernized education policy can shape the ecocentric mentality and behavior. So being educationists, we need to train our students. We need to train 
our students in environmental studies, whether it is language, whether it is management, whether it is science, technology, or engineering, because we need to inculcate that the importance of environment is a must for the very survival of mankind. Thank you very much. Sir, thank you very much for the uh, very um, scintillating lecture. Uh, you have given us a, a comprehensive idea of uh, the um, eco-centrism and, of course, anthropocentrism also. Uh, a cup, I mean, uh, perhaps this is the second time I'm hearing a vice chancellor giving a lecture because in my earlier uh, stint at Arunachal Pradesh, our former vice chancellor, Professor Atul Sharma, who is a former director of uh, I, Indian Statistical Institute, addressed the faculty, I mean, in an academic uh, uh, lecture that he has given. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, uh, giving your, uh, uh, sharing your valuable knowledge with all of us. Sir. And uh, um, one, I, I think there are so many questions, but I think Jyotirmay will be um, coordinating that. But uh, before that, I just want to know, uh, are, uh, can you, um, can we uh, really be, uh, give nature, I mean, can we really be the custodians of nature? Because by nature, as you said, we have been exploiting, extracting from nature. So um, COVID-19 has shown us that uh, we are also only a part of nature. You can't take the role of being a, a custodian because uh, all this while we have been thinking that we are custodians, we are the managers, we can control nature. But now nature has, uh, I mean, I'm not uh, uh, pessimistic about it, but nature has uh, said that you are also part of the nature as it has made us uh, uh, through this pandemic, made us realize through this pandemic. So your comments on that. Yeah, when I say, uh, when I say the custodian uh, means, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we are, we are uh, ignoring uh, the rights of other species. But here, uh, it, is, uh, it is not, uh, we have to accept that we are the most intelligent beings of this planet. So, being the intelligent beings of this planet, uh, we can, uh, we, can uh, we know that techno we have the technology, we have the knowledge, uh, and we have all the uh, intellectual resources to protect the planets. In that uh, direction, I have used this word custodian. So the custodian word will also give em emphasize the responsibility of human beings to protect this planet. I think you can Sir, yeah, start the yeah. Q&A session. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, we have one uh, question here uh, from Ahmed Ali. So did our educational system fail to create more eco-sensitive generations or do we need to reach that goal yet? Sir. Uh, uh, can, you, can, you, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, sir. Sir, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah. Ah, sir. He's asking, did our educational system fail to create more eco-sensitive generations? Or do we need to reach that goal yet? Oh, okay. Uh, this is what uh, we always uh, question uh, the education system uh, every time. But uh, I strongly feel uh, that every individual has enough capabilities to realize the importance of the environment. So we need not blame the education system every time to just uh, inculcate uh, the awareness on environment. Even, you know, a person who is uh, illiterate, who is uh, living in a tribal area, is a more, having more environmental awareness. A, a former, a traditional former have more environmental awareness. So all the time you need not blame the education system, but however, however, as, as I indicated earlier, we need to have such, the education system should play a role to see that more 
effective citizens who care about environment will emerge, will protect the environment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, can I can, one minute? Can I supplement your uh, answer, sir? Mm. Please. Yeah. 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 Uh, last time when Rajendra Singh has at uh, I mean, visited our university. Uh, he made a point saying that all our uh, institutions, higher education institutions, whether IITs or universities are only uh, teaching students how to extract from earth, but not to replenish the earth. So maybe I think this is time we need to think about replenishing the earth or uh, uh, through uh, different uh, models of teaching. I mean, uh, models of uh, bringing together interdisciplinary models of uh, teaching, etc. No, what you said is correct. Maybe when you, suppose you, you are producing a mining engineer, a mining engineer is taught how to do mining, how to exploit or extract minerals, ores, and fuels from the crystal rocks. At the same time, as you said, we should have developed the methods, technologies that should be taught, which are environmental friendly. If at all, if you disturb environment, it should be taught how to restore the environment as well after the mining or exploitation. Maybe such areas need to be strengthened in our education. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have one more question. How to balance technology and environment? Sir, is my question? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I, I told you, you know. Now the technology we have technology now, environment-friendly technologies we call. We call, whenever you do any exploitation, suppose you are processing something and producing, suppose there is a refinery. So you are refining a crude oil into various oil products and you have some kind of sludge, some kind of uh, the pollutants as the uh, as the last product of uh, this process. So there are technologies which will clean the sludge and only non-toxic parts are allowed to pass on to environment. Similarly, for every technology which is uh, exploiting and which is used to exploit resources, need to have this environment-friendly methods. So we are now developing those environment-friendly methods. Maybe we need to develop more such technologies so that the impact is lessened on environment, despite the usage and the development. Thank you. Thank you, sir. One more question is uh, from Edwin Moses uh, from Tamil Nadu. Uh, can you explain deep ecology? Oh, what is that question? Uh, explanation of deep ecology. So that, that answer uh, must be given by the ecologists, <laughs> uh, mainly, uh, the deep ecology. Uh, I, I, uh, maybe I suppose uh, it is the, uh, the explanation of that complexity of ecological system, I, I, I suppose. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, as um, our registrar, sir, has gone on another assignment, which is very important. I have to uh, give the concluding remarks for this uh, session and all, all the colloquium. Sir, uh, it is a very uh, good presentation. And in the chat box, we have all uh, um, appreciation for the uh, well-organized presentation and simple that is very interesting and brief to the lay people like us, especially for literature and arts background, faculty and students. And you have given interested uh, facts on our origin of the earth, trees, animals. Uh, and uh, the fact uh, is more in interesting to know that we are the youngest species of the earth because um, people think that they are the masters of the universe and they are the seniors above all. And you are catching phrase like uh, ego versus eco was very superb, sir, uh, because uh, man is destroying the environment only because of his egocentric uh, approaches instead of ecocentric making them. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, your statement that uh, human being has been creating the age of unnatural extinctions. 
of course uh, animals birds plants are extincting and uh, uh, perhaps human beings are thinking that we are safe and now corona virus has reminded us that you are also not safe there is a danger of extinction waiting for us uh, and uh, your statement that poverty is man made disaster is fabulous sir and uh, i uh, it is very much uh, uh, appreciating uh, and it shows your marxist orientation and which is of course the need of they are uh, to balance uh, on this earth because inequal societies are uh, the reason behind the creation of such pandemics also one of the reasons it is not always the technology but uh, the inequal societies and the way people live is also contributing to this uh, sir listening to your presentation i felt that man who declared himself to be the master of the universe during the enlightenment period has been continuously exploiting nature as an object he has been exploiting the natural resources indiscriminately and did not listen to nature that is speaking to him or to us in the form of mild natural calamities at times and severe at more times hence it to re recoup its balance mother nature has taken the wand and it this time this is the corona virus and it has uh, you know it awakened the total globe and we are pondering on what we are going to do next so with these brief conclusions i thank you very much sir uh, for giving a wonderful presentation which was enlightening in all aspects and it was very informative and nice uh, presentation with all the visuals very impressive presentation that you made sir we are happy to see our vice chancellor as an academician and teacher and we uh, you gave us this opportunity for the first time perhaps uh, uh, our vice chancellor of adikavi nanna university is giving such a uh, intellectual and academic lecture thank you uh, once again sir thank you now i take this opportunity to extend my thanks to all the faculty participants uh, participants official student participants who were uh, here uh, throughout the sessions and were engaging continuously uh, giving comments in the chat box and uh, question answer questions uh, sessions etc i thank you one and all for being a part of uh, this program thank you one and all Oh, uh, thank you. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ramesh. Sir. Thank you, Jyoti Ramesh. Thank, thank you very much, sir, for uh, yeah making it a day, <laughs> a, a wonderful academic day. <laughs> Maybe I want to know uh, the comments by uh, the uh, participants at a later date. Thank you. Yes, sir. I will get back to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.